Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to Blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hello, this is Todd DeHoop, and welcome to the Motocross Vault. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at one of the most unique and interesting machines of the late 80s and early 90s, ATK's 406. Started by Horse Lightner in the early 80s, ATK was a brand that used modern and innovative chassis technology paired with old-fashioned motors. Uh, all of the ATKs used Rotax engines, which were these Austrian-built machines that kind of came to fame in the 70s with Can-Am. Uh, but by the mid-80s, these were very old-fashioned engines. They were certainly not cutting edge anymore. And uh, I'll get into a little bit of the story, how that all came about. But long story short, you had a little bit of simplicity and, you know, ruggedness in the motor with very cutting edge, very interesting chassis design. And these made for very interesting motorcycles. The bikes, um, you know, weren't necessarily the best machine in any one category. They were kind of designed to do a little bit of everything. But uh, the 406 was a very competent off-road machine. I think you could go fast on, you know, a motocross track, but the problem is you're going to have to ride a little more aggressively because it was definitely down on power. The motor, even though it was a 406, an open-class bike, it was an older design. You know, in 1979 when it came out, it was a very powerful engine, but by, you know, the end of the 80s, uh, motocross had moved quite a bit forward. You know, all the 500s were putting out just ridiculous amounts of power. So the bike wasn't really competitive in terms of overall motor performance, uh, but it had a very excellent uh, suspension package, had very uh, good handling chassis. So the bike could be very fast and could be ridden very competitively, but you need to have a different style than you would like on a CR500 or something. And what this video is going to get into is a little bit of how that happened and cover the 406 a little bit. It's a very interesting story. Um, now, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other stuff I've done. I've done many other machines of all stripes, off-road, motocross, and um, ATVs as well. If you'd like to support the Motocross Vault, I have Motocross Vault merch available. I have tons of different designs, uh, pretty much all the manufacturers. I don't think I've done an ATK design yet. Maybe if this video gets enough interest, I'll do one of those as well. But um, from Kawasaki, Honda, Husqvarna even, uh, KTM, pretty much all the major brands, you find some gear on my website. I'll put a link in the description below and also a card here in the video if you'd like to check that out. Uh, and I, as always, I really, really appreciate the support and uh, thank you for everything you do out there. If you'd like, subscribe and share on social media, I would very much appreciate that as well. Uh, so here, without further ado, is the story of the ATK 406. Today, the name ATK is all but forgotten in the world of motocross. Like Mako, Bultaco, CZ, and Can-Am, ATK has faded from a position of prominence to a footnote in the annals of motocross history. Founded by Austrian-born engineer Horst Leitner in the early 1980s, ATK was once the most innovative brand in the sport. A Grand Prix motocross racer in the 1960s, Leitner used his racing know-how and inventive mind to create some of the most unique designs of the 70s and 80s. While not all of his forward-thinking ideas have endured, his novel concepts on rear suspension design continue to influence the mountain bike industry to this day. As Leitner's racing career came to a close in the 1970s, he became interested in designing a way to reduce the effects of engine torque on his machine's rear suspension. At the time, suspension travel was growing by leaps and bounds, and the engineers were having a difficult time overcoming the many challenges these long travel designs presented. Leitner believed that one of the major forces holding back suspension performance was the binding and squatting that occurred once power was applied to the rear wheel. As you increase torque to the rear wheel, the rear suspension compressed and reduced the travel available to deal with the track obstacles. This squatting of rear suspension was also affecting the chassis balance and reduced the traction of the front wheel on the exit of turns. By reducing this squatting effect, Leitner believed he could both improve the handling and rear suspension performance of his machine. Patented in 1981, Leitner's answer was a device which reduced the torque applied to the rear suspension by rerouting the chain over a pair of rollers above and below the swing arm. Sold commercially as the A-Track Torque Eliminator, this device could be bolted onto street and dirt machines to improve handling and suspension performance. After the A-Track proved a commercial success, Leitner and his team broadened their sights by developing a complete ready-built chassis that could accept motors from the immensely popular XR350 and XR500 four-strokes. At the time, four-strokes were mostly a novelty in motocross, with ancient TT-powered ProTech Yamaha still garnering much of the racing market. The arrival of ATK's ready-built racers immediately upped the state of the art in four-stroke motocross design, with modern ergonomics and suspension finally available to racers who preferred not to mix oil with their gas. It was not long before the Austrian automobile and motorcycle manufacturer Puk approached Leitner about building an ATK-branded motorcycle. 
At the time, Pook was out of the motocross business, but the manufacturer had enjoyed a brief run of racing success in the mid-70s with Harry Everts at the controls. Everts and Pook had took home the 1976 250 World Motocross title on an ultra-exotic twin-carb machine that is still renowned for its blazing fast motor performance. Pook promised the backing to get the ATK operation up and running and help facilitate access to Austrian-built Rotax motors. Throughout most of the 70s, the name Rotax was synonymous with serious horsepower. Their rotary valve two-stroke power plants were as much as 20% more powerful than their competition and renowned for their eye-opening performance. Unfortunately, however, the chassis they were bolted to were rarely up to harnessing that impressive performance. By the early 80s, innovations by the Japanese had eclipsed Rotax's two-stroke performance, but the power of their thundering thumpers remained unassailed. Because of this, and Leitner's desire to sell a unique and premium machine, the ATK was slated to employ Rotax's 562cc single overhead cam four-stroke motor in a built-to-order chassis. Each bike was built specifically to the desires of its owner, with a selection of suspension components available. All ATKs featured a linkless rear suspension design and their patented A-Track anti-torque elimination system. Shock duties were handled by a premium white power damper, valved to the size, speed, and intended use of the buyer. Up front, the customer could choose between a set of 43mm conventional shallow forks, or for an additional $195, WP's very trick all-new inverted alternatives. Once again, the spring rates and valving will be meticulously set up for each customer before delivery. Launched in 1985, the ATK 560 proved to be a tremendous hit with well-heeled buyers looking to race a unique and highly competitive four-stroke machine. With a price tag of two to three times that of a typical Japanese 500, the ATK was a premium machine aimed at a very targeted market. Produced in very limited numbers out of a small Southern California factory, the ATK 560 quickly became one of the most coveted motocross machines of the mid to late 80s. Just as ATK was emerging as America's motocross power, Can-Am was preparing to shut its doors. Owned by Canadian snowmobile pioneer Bombardier Inc., Can-Am had been founded in 1971 as an effort to fill out their snowmobile dealer's summer lineup. Leveraging their ownership of Rotax, Bombardier hit the ground running with a lineup of blisteringly fast machines that immediately scored success on the national and international stage. The new Can-Am motocross and off-road models captured gold in the international six-day trial and took home national motocross and supercross titles with riders like Gary Jones and Jimmy Ellis at the controls. With their powerful Rotax motors, the Can-Ams of the 70s were revered for their power and feared for their often evil handling. By the early 80s, however, Rotax's horsepower advantage had faded, and Can-Am was no longer interested in going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese. In 1983, Bombardier licensed the brand and outsourced the development of Can-Ams to British manufacturer Armstrong CCM. While this did lead to more modern designs, the Can-Ams of the early 80s remained largely uninspired performers. By 1987, Bombardier was ready to pull the plug and shut down their motorcycle operation. With the departure of Can-Am, Bombardier's dealer network was left once again without machines to sell in the warm summer months. Seeing this as a potential problem moving forward, Bombardier reached out to their American motorcycle partner ATK for a solution. As the supplier of Rotax motors used on the 560 Thumpers, Bombardier already had a relationship with Leitner and his team. Bombardier planned to commission ATK to produce a line of off-road machines based around their aging lineup of air-cooled two-stroke Rotax motors. If successful, this would allow Bombardier to offload a ton of leftover motors and beef up the inventory of their dealer's stock. Seeing this as an opportunity to further expand his brand, Leitner took on the challenge of turning a decade-old motor into a winning motocross and off-road package. As with the 560 four-stroke, the true innovation on ATK's all-new two-stroke models was their chassis design. By 1988, all of the major manufacturers had moved on to a single-shock, rising-rate linkage design for their rear suspension systems. These linkage designs allowed the engineers to develop rear suspension systems that could cope with small chop and massive hits with equal aplomb. For the ATK, Leitner and his team had focused on simplicity in their rear suspension design. They believed that by using careful shock placement and their patented A-Track system, they could produce better results while saving 6 pounds and reducing complexity. Knowing their bikes were going to be down on power compared to the competition, the ATK engineers realized they were going to have to leverage every asset in their arsenal to extract competitive performance. With that in mind, the ATK team scrutinized every component and rethought conventional wisdom to optimize performance. To reduce unsprung weight, the rear disc brake was downsized and relocated to the countershaft. This both lowered the mass of the rear wheel and reduced the chance of damaging the rotor. To further lessen the chance of brake-related failure, the rear master cylinder was relocated to the front of the motor and the rear brake pedal was reversed to point rearward. Because the brake received less cooling air in this position, 
ATK employed specially insulated pads and a temperature-resistant fluid developed for Formula One car racing to reduce fading. On the chassis front, the ATK was fairly conventional aside from its lack of a rear linkage. The frame twos were crafted by C&J Racing Frames out of tough chromoly steel and paired with a sturdy alloy swing arm built by Calfab. As with the 564 stroke, white power was selected as a suspension supplier and their super adjuster shock and 4054 inverted forks handled the track taming duties. To save development costs, the wheels, hubs, and complete front brake assembly were KTM units with some slight modifications made to accommodate the lack of a rear caliper and slightly different axle sizes employed on the ATK. The bodywork was sourced from Italian plastic giant Acerbis and featured a slim profile that riders appreciated. Being a sort of do-it-all machine designed for motocross and off-road use, the 406 featured a large 2.7 gallon tank that made it more suitable for enduro and off-road racing. While the chassis on the new ATK 406 was cutting edge, its motor was anything but. Dating back to the late 70s, this air-cooled two-stroke offered simplicity, lightweight, and reliability as its main virtues. Displacing 399cc, the Rotax mill featured a case redesign that employed a 38mm caheine for its fuel delivery. To extract more performance, the ATK engineers developed a large ram air intake that placed the airbox up high next to the gas tank. This both allowed the machine to draw in the maximum amount of fresh air and increased its ability to pour deep water safely. As was common when the motor was developed, the Rotax mill lacked any sort of variable exhaust port to broaden its power. This simplified maintenance but further hindered its performance on the track. Aside from new porting, its fancy airbox, and a modern carburetor, the 406's motor was largely the same as what Can-Am had used on its MX-6 models all the way back in 1980. On the track, the ATK was a very different sort of open class machine. Compared to its 500cc rivals, the 406 was positively mellow. Without the benefit of a power valve, the power band was narrower than the Kawasaki's Ultra Broad KX500, and the motor did not hit nearly as explosively as Honda's shoulder straining CR500. Off the line, the 406 was torquey and smooth, with its Enduro origins evident in its highly tractable delivery. This meant that riders could be far more aggressive with the throttle, without fear of the machine getting out of sorts or trying to loop over backwards. In the mid-range, there was a strong surge of power that tapered off noticeably as the machine pulled into the top end. Its best power was to be found in the mid-range, but the bike could be revved out in a pinch. In truth, the 406 was only slightly more powerful than a good running 250, and only for a short spurt in the mid-range. In 1988, Kawasaki's all-new KX250 actually bested the 406 at most points on the dyno curve. The KX250 was snappier out of the hole and more powerful on top, but the 406 was still capable of producing enough power for most situations. Helping the ATK make the most of its modest power with its lightweight and excellent chassis. At 215 pounds, it was 20 pounds lighter than most of its 500cc rivals, and lighter than some 250s as well. The ATK could be thrown around in a way that would put you on your head on most big bores. It was tossable in the air and nimble on the ground, and felt much more like a strong 250 than a ground-pounding 500. This helped the ATK's pilot keep up momentum in turns and negated some of the power disadvantages it had against traditional 500s. On the 406, you could keep the power on longer going in and roll it on sooner coming out. By riding the machine more like a 250 than a full 500, the 406 was capable of turning very competitive lap times. In the turns, the ATK's smooth power, light feel, and well-thought-out chassis gave the 406 some of the best handling in the open class. It was lithe in the corners and admirably stable at speed. There was far less of the head shake that plagued fierce wobblers like the CR500R and better front-wheel traction than the bullet train like KX. It was a great do-it-all chassis that was as happy turning laps as it was blazing across the desert. On the suspension front, the ATK 406 used premium Dutch components and careful setup to deliver one of the best suspension packages available. Each machine was individually set up for its intended rider, and this allowed the ATK to offer a level of performance not practical on a mass-produced machine. The A-Track system and careful shock placement allowed the ATK's engineers to provide a smooth ride that followed the terrain flawlessly in most off-road and track conditions. Without a traditional linkage and with the A-Track taking out some of the pop in the shock's action, it was not ideal for supercross-style tracks, but the 406 was never designed to be a stadium machine. Off-road, it gobbled up rocks and logs, and on the track, it laughed at chop coming out of turns. Up front, the white power 4054 inverted cartridge forks were the absolute state of the art in 1988 and performed flawlessly with proper setup. The same units that received poor marks on KTMs of the time garnered raves on the ATK. Once again, this was due to the individual attention each 406 received. On the detailing front, the ATK was excellent in some areas and a work in progress in others. The unique rear brake was popular for its damage resistance, but panned for its propensity to overheat. 
When fresh, it worked well, but once it heated up, its power went away noticeably. Even with its high-tech fluid and special pads, the lack of cooling air funnel to the disc and its overall small size was difficult to overcome when pushed. Up front, the KTM Source front binder was likewise a middling performer. It offered decent power and feel, but most riders rated it below the Nissan components found in the Japanese machines. The ATK's unique airbox made the machine a virtual submarine, but water and debris could find their way in under certain conditions. Thankfully, this problem will be addressed with a new airbox cover on later 406s. While most riders found the ergonomics comfortable, taller pilots did complain that the pegs were too high and the seat was too low. For those riders, ATK's optional taller saddle seemed to allay most of those issues. While the motor was not particularly powerful, its reliability was legendary. The Rotax motor was nearly indestructible and super simple to work on. Like the YZ490, this made the ATK a perfect mount for adventurers and enthusiasts who are more concerned with making it back to camp than getting there in any real hurry. For most riders, the biggest complaint with the 406's motor was its old-fashioned European clutch pull, which harkened back to the days when most riders ignored the left-hand lever entirely. The frame, swing arm, seat, aluminum bars, plastic, and switchgear were all above average quality and in keeping with ATK's intention to market the 406 as a premium machine. At $38.95, the 406 cost nearly 25% more than its Japanese competitors, and it was important that consumers felt they were getting a good value for that extra money. Today, the ATK 406 remains one of the most interesting machines of its era. The product of a convergence of commercial necessity and a little parts bin engineering, the 406 turned out to be the jack-of-all-trades Can-Am's dealers needed. While it was not destined to be a world-beater on a motocross circuit, its exclusivity and unique nature made it hugely appealing to riders looking for something different than the universal Japanese motorcycle. Even with a substantial cost premium over the Japanese, ATK sold out of every 406 it could make in 1988 before the first machine even rolled off the assembly line. Intended as a lifeline to its dealers, the 406 and its stablemates propelled ATK past KTM to fifth place in sales in North America in the early 90s. With the departure of Leitner to start AMP Research in 1991, the ATK brand lost the visionary force that had driven it throughout the 1980s. The result of that loss would be a steady decline of the brand in the 1990s. Machines like the 406 will continue in the ATK lineup with minor changes for several more years, but the days of wild innovation were gone. In the 80s, Leitner and his team created a brand based on doing things differently, and the result of that out-of-the-box thinking was some of the most interesting machines of their time. Bold, brave, and just a bit bizarre, the ATK 406 and its siblings turned out to be machines that were greater than the sum of their parts. So there you have it. That's the story of the ATK 406, a machine that started out as a lifeline to Mabardi Ace dealers and turned out to be a huge success story and uh, one of the most interesting machines of its era for sure. I never got a chance to ride one of these 406s, although I did have a friend who sold ATKs and he did let me ride his 250 one time. Uh, it was like an 88, 89 era. And I remember being struck by just how different it felt. The suspension action was just kind of strange. I thought the seat was a little bit hard. The ergonomics just felt a little weird. It was just... Coming off like a Japanese machine at the time, it definitely was a different experience. Uh, the motor on that 250 was not particularly powerful, but it was a cool bike. I looked all over at Google. I thought it was just a neat machine at the time. I think the no-link design has become kind of panned. I've had several KTMs with the no-link, and I actually never had any problem with any of them. I thought they all worked really well. But, of course, I'm not riding a Supercross track. I think for hardcore Supercross, obviously it's not ideal. But for the average rider, motocross and off-road use, it works very well. And it saved a lot of weight. These bikes were super light. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's lighter than most 250s in 1988, which is pretty impressive. You also had much less to worry about braking on the thing, too. You know, you had, didn't have radiators to smash or a power valve to service or any of that stuff. So depending on the type of use you were, if you're looking for a bike that where you could do a little bit of everything, I think it really was a great choice for that. And ATK sold a ton of them. They were really successful there. Unfortunately, once Leitner left the company, uh, they kind of lost focus on things, and the bikes, ATKs, kind of drifted into just doing dual sports. It's kind of weird. The 90s ATK is not so great. Um, the late 80s, and I guess early 90s, uh, still were really cool machines there for a while. It's certainly a unique machine and a machine that probably a lot of people don't know a lot about. So if you like this sort of thing, if you could share, subscribe, uh, definitely leave a comment below. I very much appreciate it. It helps people find the channel. And again, I appreciate all the help and support everybody gives me out there. Uh, so until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Fault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.